Hey everyone, Pastor Tom here. We have started the Light of the World Zoom groups, and there are four of them. However, I realize that uh, those times may not work for everyone, and you might not be in a group, but I did want you to have the benefit of hearing the lessons that are taught by Pastor Stanley, and also I would like to just ask some questions uh, similar to the questions that I I'm asking to the online group members. So in case you're not in a group, you can still be a part in this way. And my hope is that all of us in the darkness of this season that we're going through, all of us will finish the year strong in that we will recognize and remember again the true light of the world and that there is hope. Listen now to a short message by Pastor Andy Stanley, and then after that, I will ask some questions that you can just be thinking about on your own. I really, really do love this time of year, and again, because right now, for us, right now, it's not complicated. And I think one of the reasons that's such a big deal to me is because for the last really like 24 or 25 years, my family of origin was very complicated. And, and some of you understand this. For about 25 years, the four of us were never able to get into the same room during Christmas. You know, any two of us, any three of us just about, but getting all four of us together. And, it, and it's nobody's fault, you know, the history doesn't matter, the story doesn't matter. It was just relationally complicated. And throughout the year, as, as you know, you're not really aware of that because, you know, we can have lunch and we can have dinner, the two of us can meet. But at Christmas, the time frame gets compressed, right? Because there's that Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, night before Christmas thing that gets so important and who's gonna be with who and who's coming over and if they're coming, they can't come and we just, you know, it's just complicated at Christmas. So for the past 20 something years, it's just been complicated because we host and I've sort of had to navigate and officiate and decide who can come when and who can't. And it's just, it's just extremely complicated. And it makes me so grateful that right now, you know, <laughs> my immediate family, the six of us, um, it's just not complicated. The most, uh, the, the most complicated maybe Christmas of, of all for me is when this whole thing got started about, I'm, th I'm thinking about 24 years ago. Um, it was in my, the first Christmas that my parents had split up. And some of you, you have your own story. So this is my sad story. And so we're coming up on Christmas and we had a tradition where um, my family would go to my parents' house. We would do Christmas Eve, you know, open gifts, have a big dinner. And then about 10 or 11 at night, we'd jump in the car and go to Sandra's family's house. She lives about two and a half hours outside her family's lives in a town about two and a half hours from Atlanta. So we had this tradition. So as we're approaching this first Christmas where my mom had moved out, she's living somewhere else. She has her own Christmas plans. My dad's in the house that I'd kind of grown up in through college, end of high school and college. He's there in this big house by himself. And as we're approaching Christmas, it dawns on me, uh-oh, if we do what we normally do, Sandra and I and our little son, Andrew, he was a baby and it was the first grandchild on our side and the first grandchild in Sandra's entire family. So he's like a really, really important deal, you know, that first grandchild. So um, as, we're, as we're approaching Christmas, it dawns on me, what are we gonna do? Because my mom already has plans. So, you know, she's got some folks. My dad's gonna be in this big old house by himself. And so we're gonna show up on Christmas Eve if we do our normal thing, have Christmas Eve dinner with him. It's just him and me and Sandra and a baby and then exchange gifts. And then we jump in the car and leave him by himself in this big house. And then he wakes up Christmas morning by himself. And it was just killing me to think about this. I mean, I, as we got closer and closer, I thought, what are we gonna do? You know, how do you navigate? How do you make everybody happy? And so I did in that circumstance, what I would normally do, I did two things. I prayed and then I called my buddy, Charlie Rimfro. Now, Charlie, you've heard me mention Charlie before. Charlie was a guy that mentored me through the years. And whenever I had, you know, just kind of a, kind of a no-win situation or a problem or a question, I would go to Charlie and say, Charlie, what do I do? So I called Charlie. I said, we need to get together. Christmas is coming. And I really don't know what to do. This is complicated. And so we got together and Charlie did what Charlie would always do. He didn't answer my question. <clears throat> he told me a story. And this is the story he told me. He said, Andy, <clears throat> he said, Andy, let me tell you something. He said, just a little while after Patty and I got married, a few years after we got married, one night we're gonna go out and celebrate our anniversary. We're all dressed up and she's looking beautiful and I'm looking sharp and we're about to walk out the door and the phone rings. And I answer the phone and it's my mama. And my mama says, Charles, your daddy's acting up again. I need you to get over here and help me. Now, Charles, Charlie's dad was a second world war veteran. 
And in some, in some sense, he was a hero. But like is the, but, you know, as is the case sometimes with veterans, when he finished that war, he came back home and he had different wars he had to fight, different battles to fight. And on this particular night, one of those battles had kicked in. And so he's on the phone, standing there looking at Patty at the door, ready to go celebrate their anniversary. He's on the phone, his mom's saying, hey, you know, Charlie, I need you, Charles, I need you to come help me. And, and, and Charles, Charlie looked at me and said, Andy, and I, on that evening, I made, a very, I made a strategically bad decision. He said, I got in my car and raced off to try to solve a 40-year-old problem that I wasn't about to be able to solve, and in doing so, created a brand new problem at home. Now, for some of you, that was worth getting up for just to come hear that, that part of the story because I just, I just solved one of your, your big Christmas dilemmas, but I'm gonna keep going. He said, so, he looked at me, he said, so Andy, he said, let me tell you what you do. You and Sandra and your youngin', you get over there and you have dinner with your daddy, you open some gifts, you have a nice meal, and when it's time to go, you load them both up and you head on up the road to spend Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with Sandra's family. And that was good advice. And that's what I did. But it felt terrible. It just felt terrible, it felt wrong. In fact, I called my dad yesterday, I said, Dad, can I, can I share this story? He said, absolutely. He said, that's what Christmas is for most people to some degree. I said, absolutely, it is. And I called Charlie, I said, hey, is it okay, Charlie, if I tell this story? He said, absolutely. He said, it's a good story and it's true. <laughs> and to some extent, at some point in all of our lives, it's a little bit of our story. Because here's the thing at Christmas that makes Christmas so wonderful and sometimes so terrible. And it's mostly wonderful. But the thing that creates the tension in Christmas is this. At Christmas, Christmas exaggerates all the bad and at the same time points us to something that's absolutely incredible. Because Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year, but it's not the most wonderful time of the year necessarily because of what is happening around us. It's the most wonderful time of the year, but it's not the most wonderful time of the year because of what's happening. Because what's happening oftentimes at Christmas and what gets exaggerated and what gets focused on because the time gets compressed is that at Christmas we're reminded that there are problems we can't solve, right? There are people we can't control, right? And there's expectations we can't meet. And the truth is, if we pause long enough to look in the mirror, I'm the problem I can't solve, right? And I'm the person I can't seem to control, and I'm the person oftentimes setting expectations that other people can't meet. So at Christmas, at Christmas, it really is the most wonderful time of the year, but it's not necessarily the most wonderful time of the year because of what is happening. That there's a sense in which Christmas is not the most wonderful time of the year because of who physically is with us, but it's the most wonderful time of the year because at Christmas, we are reminded who is for us. And the darker things get and the more complicated things get, and at Christmas time, everything gets a little bit exaggerated, but at the same time, at Christmas time, we're able to focus on the light of the world that has come into this world to make an extraordinarily practical difference in each of our lives. Okay, so I'm gonna ask some questions that um, I ask those in the online Zoom groups, and you can be thinking about it and uh, they're in relation to the message that you just heard. So take some time and I'll pause and I'll give you a few moments just to think about the questions I ask. Here's the first one. Why are things so complicated at Christmas this time of year? Why, why are things so complicated? And secondly, what are your complications right now? Here's a question for you. Are you trying to solve a 40-year-old problem as Pastor Stanley talked about? Is it a problem that is ongoing and honestly you really can't do anything about it I mean you don't have the power to fix it if you would have you would already have fixed it here's a question do you find that it's true that Christmas seems to exaggerate 
the stresses in life or the things that might already seem bad. Pastor Annerly referred to three things that he actually says get exaggerated during this Christmas season or any Christmas season. And here are the three things. Problems we can't solve. People we can't control. And expectations that we can't meet. So again, the question is, do you find that now it seems that those problems are worse than ever for you? Problems we can't solve, people we can't control, and expectations that we can't meet. And then here's one more question, and I'll get back to one more short segment by Andy Stanley. And the question is this, even though Christmas exaggerates the bad in life, do you feel that perhaps, on the other hand, Christmas points towards something really good? I mean, beyond the presents and all of that. So Christmas does have a way of exaggerating the bad, but isn't there hope that Christmas points toward? Pastor Stanley said that Christmas should give us the realization that there is someone that is for us. that someone is God. Listen now to the the final segment of Pastor Stanley's message, and then I'll just wrap it up right after that. Now, as you know, or if you grew up in church, you, you probably know this, but at the beginning of the New Testament, there are four gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there's four different accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their accounts are very similar. John's is very different. But the thing that makes John's gospel so unique, especially this time of the year, is that when John wrote his gospel, he was a very old man. And when John sat down to write his gospel, we don't know this for sure, but it seems as if maybe he was thinking, I better write this down because I don't have a lot of time left. And I want to make sure that these stories are passed on for future generations, because there is no doubt we know from the book of Acts that John had told these stories many, many, many times, hundreds of times. Imagine if you're somebody who sat at the feet of Jesus, how popular you would be with Christians. Anywhere John went, anytime John went anywhere, Christians would say, Tell us what it was like. We've heard the stories, but you were an eyewitness. So he's told these stories many, many, many times. John is the person, this is amazing, especially when you find out more about him. John is the person that reduced reduced God to a single word. John is the person that sat back and said, okay, let me make this as simple and as clear as possible. God is, remember this? Love. John is the one who said that. And the thing that's so amazing about John saying that is because of what John had seen and what John had experienced in his life. He's a very, very old man. And he's experienced loss like you cannot even begin to imagine, no matter what your story is like. He's lost friends. He's lost family members. He's lost, in some ways, he's almost lost his whole society and his whole culture. John was alive when Nero sent General Vespasian into Galilee. And he began to work his way down through Galilee, rolling up all these Jewish cities and all these Jewish towns, slaughtering thousands and thousands of Jewish people and sending thousands and thousands of men, women, and children into the slave markets of Rome. John lived through that. John lived through the time when Vespasian left his son outside the city of Jerusalem, the holy city of Jerusalem, where John had spent many, many years and had experienced some of the most amazing events of his life in the city of Jerusalem. And he either saw that city surrounded, we don't know, or perhaps John was in the city of Jerusalem for those seven months when people starved to death, plagues broke out, and the Roman army built a ditch and a wall all the way around the city trying to get inside that city. 
At the end of that, that Jewish war in 70 AD, John was either there or heard the story about the temple being burnt to the ground. Over a million Jews were slaughtered. Over 100,000, over two or 300,000, some say, slaves were taken from the city of Jerusalem and again flooded the Roman slave markets. By the time he had written this, his friend Peter and his friend Paul had been executed by Nero. And through all of that bloodshed, and through all of that loss, and through all of that chaos that we cannot even begin to imagine, John never lost faith. In fact, at the end of his gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, at the end of the gospel of John, here's what John writes. He says this, he says, Jesus performed many other signs because he's filled his gospel with the signs that Jesus had performed, seven specific signs. He said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In other words, I've just given you a taste of what we experience with Jesus. And then he says this, but these are written, but these are written that you may believe. In other words, the reason I'm even writing this gospel, the reason I'm leaving this with you is I'm hoping that after you read this account of Jesus' life, you won't simply be impressed, you won't simply be amazed, but I'm writing this so that you might believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life, not physical life, because everybody reading this already had physical life, that you may have a different kind of life in his name. That regard, in spite of what John had seen, in spite of what John had smelled, in spite of what John had experienced, at the end of his life, with the destruction of everything important to him and the loss of every, just about everyone important to him. John still believed that Jesus was the source of some kind of life that went beyond physical life. And yet when John begins his gospel, he doesn't begin with shepherds. He doesn't begin with a manger. He doesn't begin with Egypt. He doesn't begin with Herod and the slaughter of children, little boys in Bethlehem. He begins with the significance of the birth of Jesus. And just like they were very, very dark days when John wrote this gospel, John was reminded that Jesus was born at a time when it was very, very dark as well. And when he sat down to start his gospel, before he got into the narratives, before he got into the details, here's what he said. And this is so extremely powerful. Because in a time of our lives and in a season of our lives when things can get so complicated, when we're reminded not only of who is coming, but who won't come, when we're reminded of what we're going to get and we're reminded of what we will never get, John begins his gospel with the birth of Jesus this way. Here's what he says. He says, in him, Jesus, in him was life, not physical life, in him, and John's trying to put it into words. You know, he's got all this, this experience. He's had all this time to think about it, and he's had all this perspective, and he's seen things come and go, and people born and die, and he's seen the destruction of everything important. And he's, he summarizes it. He said, when I think about Jesus, the best way I know to put it is, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Now, this was such a huge statement because when Jesus showed up on the planet and they viewed, began to view him as the Jewish Messiah, they thought that what Jesus was going to do would be regional, that what Jesus would do would be for Israel, that what Jesus would do would be a manifestation or a, a continuation of the Old Testament. And John sits back as an old man and he says, I realize now that Jesus didn't simply come for us and Jesus didn't simply come for the Jews that what Jesus came for was all mankind, that he brought an element of life and he brought a light that was for all mankind. And John was there the day when Jesus had risen from the dead and he gathered everyone together and they said to Jesus, okay, Jesus, is now the time that you're gonna restore Israel as a kingdom? Is now the time that you're gonna restore the nation Israel? Are we about to do something new and run the Romans out of here and reestablish our independence? Is now the time? And John was there when Jesus said, that's none of your business. 
The reason that you're here is because you are to go into every single nation and you are to share with every single ethnic group and every single people group what you have heard me say. You are to make disciple of, uh, disciples of all nations that this light isn't a Jewish light. This is a light for all mankind. And then he says this, this is my favorite part. Again, he's just starting off his gospel. It's like, well, here's the introduction. And the light shines in the darkness and he thought about the darkness around him. Darkness that, again, we can't really even begin to imagine. In spite of that, this light shines in the darkness, in spite of all that. And then he says, and the darkness has not, and I think he paused and thought, what's the right word? It's like everyone understands what, what it means for light to shine in darkness, for light to shine in darkness and to expose what was in the darkness. But this light, this light of Christ, this light of Jesus, it shines in the darkness and it's as if the darkness is hard as it has tried to put it out, to snuff it out, to overwhelm it, to seize it, to imprison it, to surround it, to, to understand it. it is, as hard as, as it seems the world and our culture has tried to blow out this light. John says, the darkness has not overcome it. This is a man who got news that the apostle Paul had been executed, as I said, that Peter had been executed. Perhaps he was the last apostle alive. And with a grin on his face, I'm sure he wrote, in spite of everything this world has tried to do, to eradicate the light that is life, the darkness, has not overwhelmed it. It has not put it out. Caesar couldn't do it. Tiberius couldn't do it. Nero couldn't do it. The destruction of the temple didn't do it. The death of Jesus hadn't done it. We are reminded in the midst of all of that darkness that Jesus is life and light who overcomes darkness. There is always hope. There is always a reason to believe. There is a God who hears our prayers. There's a reason to wake up every single day and take the next step. Pastor Stanley said that um, the writer of uh, the book of John in the Bible reduced God into a one word um, summary. And his description of God is simply this, love. God is love. And in the message, Pastor Andy Stanley was saying that even though things were going so bad in John's life and in the life of everyone else, and it was such a time of darkness that it seemed to make the love of God even brighter for this writer, this disciple, John. And my own experience is that when we go through really hard times, we do not stay the same. We will come out of it changed one way or the other. And I'm speaking spiritually. You don't stay the same spiritually from hard times. We will either choose to get closer to God because we just feel the desire to get closer to God and we'll see him better or we'll choose to run away from God and push him out of our life. One of the two will either get closer and as John did actually see God as a good God and a God of love or it'll harden our heart and we'll move farther away than we were before the difficult season. So I'm just gonna ask you, do you see God in a better way or a unique way than you did before the darkness? Or have you kind of grown cold toward God? Pastor Stanley said that uh, the writer of uh, the book of John um, describes Jesus as life. And that life was the light of all mankind, all of mankind, no matter who we are, 
no matter what gender we are, all of mankind, God is light and he is the life. And the answers to the darkness aren't found anywhere but through God. So all the ways that we might search for answers in in this uh, tough season that we're going through, I encourage you to start with God and he will lead you into the truth that you need to see. Get closer to God during the dark times instead of farther away. In the message, you also mentioned that the disciples were continually asking Jesus, when is the time? When, when are you going to do the things that we want you to do? When are you going to restore Israel to Israel's proper place? When, when, when? When do we get there? What, you know, how, how much longer is it going to take? And Jesus basically says, it's none of your business, you know, which is the truth that I've learned in my life, that tomorrow is none of our business. It's God's business. And we are to trust him and live in today and let him figure out tomorrow and lead us into tomorrow. Finally, I'm going to leave you with this. Pastor Stanley mentioned directly from scripture that darkness cannot overcome light. It just doesn't work that way. Light overcomes darkness. You can't have so much dark that the light goes out. In fact, the light will get brighter. You will get through this. We will get through this time in our life, this dark season. The light is God. It does not go out. He does not go out. He is your hope. He is your light. He is your life. Let him be your light in this darkness. Tune in again next week uh, for the second part of the Light of the World series.